Hey, well, um, I had a technical glitch, and I thought that I had uh, thought that I'd erased everything that lost everything that uh, I had done, um, but I didn't. So I'm breaking this first set of slides up into two small presentations um, because I can't figure out how to go in and add the rest. So we were talking about how good psychological measurement is reliable. It measures, uh, it gives consistent individual results across time, and it's valid. Um, basically, the test measures what it means to be measuring, and in the five-factor model, we're talking about people's tendencies to behave in certain, kind, in certain ways in certain kinds of situations. And the last thing I said is that in psychological measurement, in all measurement, but in psychological measurement especially, there's always error. That is, we never get um, a, a completely accurate measurement. Um, another thing to keep in mind about psychological measurement is that it is almost always relative. It's not absolute. It's relative. It's like, how does one person... Um, compare to a large group of other people. Um, so you might recall that earlier in the semester we did um, a reaction time measurement. When the red box turns green, click as quickly as you can, click anywhere to start, and you get five tries. Um, you get five tries. And I'm going to ask you to look at two things, and, and one of them doesn't stand out as much right now. One is... Okay, here is the visual description of the range of scores in milliseconds, average reaction time. And I want you to notice the shape. We'll come back to this in a minute. But the other thing I want you to remember is that we talked about the fact that they said that this test is affected by the latency of your computer and monitor using a fast computer and low latency high frame rate monitor will improve your error score will improve your score so one of the things that they're referring to right there is the idea of error that um, there's some uncertainty that's introduced to the scores based on the quality of your equipment and that really is very similar to what we're talking about in terms of error for psychological um, testing. So if intelligence is a construct about how easily and quickly we learn an individual learns to do new things, one of the things about an intelligence test is that we time them. And we have an, uh, a test administrator there with a stopwatch. And she or he's not always going to be perfect in pressing the on and off in the stopwatch. Um, when we were talking about, when we're talking about the five-factor model and personality, and we're asking people questions about, um, on a scale of one to five, how often does this statement apply to you? And so if you think about it, you think about those 120 questions on any given day, you may not answer exactly the same way um, today that you did yesterday or that you might answer tomorrow. So um, we always know that the scores are not exact, uh, but they're still um, kind of, they, they still have some meaning. So if 
if we go back, look at this, look at the shape of, of this illustration and compare it with the shape of this distribution of reaction time scores. They're not exactly the same, but they're very similar. One of the things that's a little bit different um, between a perfectly normally distributed set of scores and this distribution of reaction time scores is that, okay, here's the line. This is not going to be exact at all. Here's the line that represents the mean and the, the, the distribution of scores on the right side is not exactly the same shape as the distribution of scores on the left side. If we have got, uh, if we're measuring a construct that is clearly normally distributed, then we're going to get this bell-shaped curve, the normal curve. And when we were talking about correlation, I said that one of the things that I thought was particularly attractive about correlation is that we get the numerical coefficient, we get the score from 0 to uh, 5 to 0.5 to 0.9 to 1, 0 0.0, or 0 to negative 0.5 to negative 0.9 to negative 1. Um, and we can look at it that way, or we can look at it visually on a scatter plot. And one of the things that I have come to uh, appreciate about the normal distribution is that, again, it's a visual representation. And I like to encourage people to think about it as a measure of volume. It's a measure of how many individuals you find in a given part of the space under this curve. So this particular, this particular illustration of the normal distribution shows people stacked. So, okay, if I, if, if, if we've got, the average, five people score the average, one, two, three, four, five. And then we've also got five people um, in the pile just to the left of the average and five people just to the right of the average, but they're just a little bit more cramped up there. The person who's at the top of the pile on the average can lift their arms all the way up. And then we go the next, we go the next column over to the right, and now we've got four people, and the next column over to the left, and we've also got four people. Then we've got three people, and three people, and two people, and two people, and one person. So one of the things that this um, indicates to us is that as an individual score gets as as scores this would start at 50 or be the average and get closer either to the outside the high outside or the low outside there are proportionally fewer and fewer people who get that set of scores Now, one thing that I always encourage people to think about in terms of interpreting scores on a normal distribution is that we get three different kinds of descriptive statistics when we take a big group of people and we 
we average and and give people scores and see what scores are in the middle and what scores are um, out on the outliers liars either um, either above or below and we get three different measures there's the mean the median and the mode and the mean is essentially what we usually mean by the word average it's not exactly the same when we're doing statistics but that's sort of the shorthand that most people use so when you're looking at a set of normally distributed scores the average score is the one where 50 percent of people score below the average and 50 percent of the people score above the average so you get a score that's average half people are below half people are above that's not really the most useful way to think about average scores the most useful way to think about average scores actually is shown in this particular illustration understanding that 50 percent of individuals in a normally distributed trait that we're measuring are above the average and 50 or below is probably not as important as understanding that 50 percent of people are close to the average so here the average is zero and then we've got these these numbers here negative one and one and negative two and two represent standard deviations and that's really how the normal curve works so 50 percent of everybody on this particular measure and let's assume that this is a measure of neuroticism one of our big five traits 50 percent of everybody is between approximately two-thirds of a standard deviation below and two-thirds of a standard deviation above so that's 50 percent in here half of everybody is close to the mean and then a quarter of them half of the other 50 percent are below one you know be below just less than two-thirds of a standard deviation and half of the remaining 50 percent are above so here's to where we get that it's really too bad that um, we're not meeting face to face and I can't give you back your results so you can look at the test results that you gave me I hope some of you uh, saved them in some form or fashion um, and maybe can look at your scores when you're going through this material the scores on the IP IP Neo that we took for class are in percentile scores and I've got that in the next slide. I've also got it in a Word document. that I'm going to be putting uh, up in Canvas. So here's the mean and here's the percentile scores. 
which is how the results were reported to you. So if on any given factor or any given facet, you scored between about 28 below and about 72 above, then your score is mostly average. You're going to look in terms of your behavior and your reactions like most folks. When your facet scores or your factor scores are lower than about 28 or higher than about 72, then you begin to probably noticeably stand out from the people around you in terms of those factors or facets, in terms of your level of neuroticism, in terms of your levels of extroversion, um, agreeableness, conscientiousness, openness to experience, etc. So when you're thinking about your own scores, the ones that um, really tend to give you the most particular information about yourself are going to be like, oh, I don't know, if you're, if you, it, it's going to start, it's going to start probably um, about 15 points below the mean and about 15 points above the mean where you sort of consistently stand out from the people around you, but then it's really going to be more apparent the further you get out either above or below um, scores below about 28 or scores above 70 something. And again, I'm, I'm really sad that I can't give those back to you. Uh, and you know, maybe as the months progress, if you really are interested in seeing them, I can find a way to get them to you. But in terms of, uh, doing the stuff, all of the stuff that uh, we've got to get accomplished to finish the semester online and the complications of that, uh, that's, that's not the first thing on my list to do. So this slide is the last one we're going to look at in this section. Um, between 28 and 72 are the 50% around the middle, and uh, there's still less than one standard deviation under this kind of average. Once you get more than one standard deviation above and below, then you are more sort of individually noticeably unique than otherwise. Okay, so this is now where we're going to stop for the first two sets of presentations. Um, the next presentation, which I hope I'll get up tomorrow, um, talks some about what are the meanings of the overall factors and the individual facets. And when I see meanings, I'm talking about um, predictions that we can make about the relative likelihood of how we will or won't react in situations that are based on research, not just on, you know, know you, you like the color pink, therefore um, uh, you, you love flowers. Um, that's it for this one. I hope you're well, and I'll talk to you more soon.